Lexington County 911, what's the address of your emergency? Uh, uh, 16 London Mary Square. I need to report a missing child. Alright, re repeat that address for verification. Oh, uh, 16 London Mary Square, Casey, South Carolina. Alright, and tell me exactly what's happening. <laughs> um, I can't. We can't find my daughter. She was playing outside. I know I can't find her. And I. I have okay, to go she? around her. She is six. She's going to be okay. seven in June. Alright, alright. I'm going to stand on the line with you, but I'm going to get KCPD on the line too. But I'm going to stand on the line, so don't hang up, okay? Okay. child um, woke up this morning and uh, he wasn't he wasn't how old is uh, the child the yeah, missing child yeah how old is he he's five what was he last seen wearing um, a Mario uh, like blue long sleeve sweatshirt and uh, a black sweatpants so um when did, uh, when did your daughter go missing um, she left me at 10 o'clock last night. Um, she was going back to her house, going to back to my mom's house where, where she's staying. Um, and I told her to text me or call me when she got home and nothing. And I've been calling and texting her all day. I went over there at 4 o'clock and her car was there. Um, but she was supposed to be at work from 9 to 6. Um, I, I, Found, went back there again, like around 8, 9 o'clock, and I found her phone, um, which she never goes anywhere without her phone, and um, I can't get into her phone. I can't remember her password, but I was able to see one of her notifications, and her job texted her saying, you didn't show up to work today. Is everything okay? Um, The National Missing and Unidentified Persons System estimates that at any given time, there are minimum 90,000 to 100,000 people missing in the United States alone, with the average total number of missing people per year standing at 750,000. Of the total number of people who are reported missing every year, many of them are found or were not really missing in the first place. But sometimes, the individual who is reported missing stays missing prompting a whole slew of questions, theories, and investigations. And arguably, the most unsettling missing persons cases are the ones where there is little to no evidence or indicators of the disappearance, or if what is found points in too many directions so a stable theory of the events that took place cannot be established. A great example of this is the Maura Murray case. This is one that has infuriated internet detectives for years. A girl goes missing after behaving very oddly, her car is abandoned on the side of a rural road. Shortly before her disappearance, she is spotted by not just one, but two people. One of those people even has an interaction with her and calls the police to assist her with her broken down vehicle. Shortly after this, she would go missing and never be found. The video I released, entitled The Internet is Still Strange, did a small breakdown of this case as well as show a creepy example of what happens when a missing person's case gets a little too big and begins attracting the attention of weirdos. <laughs> Mysterious and tragic as it is, the Maura Murray case is one example of a very mainstream missing persons case. But what about the less popular cases, the ones that don't make the mainstream news, that don't get the hundreds of articles and posts? What about the ones that are just as eerie? just as mysterious but stay just out of the public eye. Some of these cases have some semblance of conclusion or resolution, or at the very least evidence that points in one specific direction, albeit unsatisfying. In some cases, though, no reasonable explanation exists. And in this video, 
we're going to take a look at some of the examples of the tragic phenomena of the missing. If anybody knows anything about where he is or if he is safe, I want them to please just tell me that. The day is August 2nd, 1986. Three-year-old Francion Pierre was with his parents Amy and Mahalil, or Lee, at a swap meet in northern Las Vegas. For those unfamiliar, a swap meet is essentially a large marketplace where individuals gather to buy, sell, or barter for various items, similar to a flea market. So at this swap meet that Francion was at with his parents, there would be a multitude of various items to look at and potentially purchase, as well as a large variety of people there looking around and browsing. At some point during the day, the three decide to stop for something to eat. So Lee buys them some food and they find a table. They had to wait a minute for the food, so in the meantime, Lee decides he's going to explore some of the other stands to see if there's anything that would catch his interest that he could buy. After a few minutes, the food is ready, but Lee is still off browsing. So Amy and their son, Francione, go up to the counter to grab the food. While they're there at the counter, Amy briefly exchanges small talk with the waitress, still keeping her son in view. They had ordered more food than Amy was able to carry on her own, so her and Francione go back to the table to drop it off, then go back to the counter to retrieve the rest of the food. While Amy is getting the rest of the food, Francione begins making his way back to the table ahead of his mother. Amy sees him but doesn't think much of it, since she'll be right behind him with the rest of the meal. However, when she did finally get back to the table shortly after, her son, Francione, was gone. Now, losing a child is probably one of the most traumatic and devastating things a parent could go through. And usually, if a child gets lost in a public place, within a few minutes they're reunited with their parents. This did not happen in the case of Francione. That moment at the concession stand at the swap meet was the last time Amy would ever see her son. And Amy and Lee were absolutely devastated. And since the feelings and emotions of losing a child in a public place were so universal, the disappearance of Francione did pick up quite a bit of attention when it first happened. The police opened up an investigation fairly quickly and began spending hours treading and retreading Francione's last steps before he disappeared, interviewing individuals who were at the swap meet, interviewing Amy and Lee, and in general, going over every possible detail as to how this little boy could have disappeared so quickly and with so little evidence. And they began to uncover quite a few inconsistencies. The main one was a big one. Throughout the investigation, the police interviewed quite a few people who were at the swap meet, and many of the individuals who they spoke to did remember seeing Amy and Lee at the swap meet, and even at the concession stand. They did not, however, recall seeing any child at all. Almost all the eyewitnesses who said they saw Lee and Amy said the couple was there alone. Following this, police began to interview Lee and Amy's neighbors. And when they did, even more odd information began to come to light. For one, Amy and Lee's neighbors claimed that the last time they saw Francione was a few weeks before the swap meet ever happened. With all of these interviews and claims creating a lot of suspicion on Francione's parents, the police subjected them to a polygraph test. And they both failed. So at this point, the perception of Amy and Lee, once viewed as sympathetic parents going through a traumatic loss, began to shift. An individual who used to babysit Francione told police she noticed bruising on the child. And then it was uncovered that Amy and Lee had been arrested on child abuse charges a year earlier posted bail, returned home, and shockingly, Francione was pulled out of the foster care he was in and placed back under the care of Amy and Lee, with the stipulation that social workers would make frequent and random visits to check on Francione. And it was an, uh, an isolated incident for something that threatened his life. Uh, he, he was coughing and choking when we pulled him from the bathroom. And the circumstances, I, I feel that it was a controlled circumstance. Fleming says she has never struck her son before or since, and Francione was soon returned to her after being taken to child aid. Fleming admits that she at first said Luster had used the belt on Francione no, because she not. wanted to be sure she would get I her son back. I disciplined my son. Uh, Lee was not involved except he, he witnessed the incident, and, and 
he never touched my son. He has never hurt my son, never spanked my son. Fleming says she hopes that the search for her son will continue vigorously despite the reports of child abuse. Shortly before Francione's disappearance, signs of abuse began to return. Francione was bruised, scratched up, and even had a burn mark on him according to a friend of Amy's. In December of 1986, Amy and Lee were both charged with obstruction due to the numerous lies they told during the investigation. They pled guilty and were sentenced to three and five months in prison respectively. Following this, Amy and Lee were released from prison the following year and moved to Florida. And with no physical evidence and no criminal charges, the case of the missing boy went cold. Until 2019. When Amy would be arrested for the murder of her son, Francione. Fast forward to 2017. We have had additional witnesses that have come forward. There was also an incident of stolen identity. Someone tried to use Francion's name, which prompted police to take another look at the case. Specifically, evidence files, including previously unseen letters that Fleming and Luster had exchanged in jail. A cold case team had uncovered additional evidence pointing directly to Amy as Francione's killer. Specifically, a letter Amy had written to Lee while in prison, which he had attempted to destroy, which said, What happened was totally unintentional. I'm sorry. I hope you know that. On August 13th, 2021, Amy entered an Alfred plea. An Alfred plea is one in which the defendant admits that the evidence uncovered during the investigation would be enough to persuade a judge or jury of their guilt beyond a reasonable doubt, but doesn't admit that they are actually guilty of the crime. Essentially, it's a guilty plea with a declaration of innocence. She faces two years in jail. The woman accused of killing her three-year-old son more than three decades ago has taken a plea deal. Amy Fleming took what is called an Alfred plea to voluntary manslaughter charges today. That means she admits there is enough evidence to convict her without admitting guilt. Her son, Francione Pierre's body was never found after disappearing in 1986. Fleming will be sentenced in December. There are no plans to pursue charges against Lee at this time, and the details around the disappearance of Francione are not known. No body has ever been discovered, no physical evidence has ever been uncovered, the true meaning of Amy's letter has yet to be interpreted, and to this day, Amy still claims her innocence. Today is an example of uh, justice delayed is not justice denied. And it just goes to show you that through the hard work of law enforcement, uh, we should never give up. We should never stop working a case. Now I'm back and not ashamed to cry. Ooh, baby, here I am, signed, sealed, delivered. I'm yours. I'm yours. Here I it's possible that some of you might recognize this woman, Angela Martin Fields. Angela Martin Fields was a contestant on American Idol, a show in which individuals sing in front of judges to ultimately be crowned the American Idol for that particular season, and she appeared on the show in seasons 7, 8, and 9. What some might not know about Angela, however, is in December 2009, a mysterious tragedy struck her family. And as of the making of this video, that mysterious tragedy still has no definitive answers. Angela Martin's mother, Viola, was visiting her during Christmas of 2009 at her home in Glenwood, Illinois. The day after Christmas, Angela's sister, Latrina, was being released from the hospital and would be back at her home. And so Viola was going to leave Angela's home to go visit her daughter, Latrina, and see how she was doing. Latrina lived about 20 miles away from Angela, which is where Viola would have been leaving from. Viola never made it to Latrina's house. The family attempted to search for Viola on their own, but after their own efforts turned up nothing, on December 29th, four days after Viola went missing, the Martin family reported her missing to police, and a search was conducted to try and find Viola. One day later, her car, a tan 1999 Chrysler Cirrus, was found abandoned, parked illegally on a street in Dixmoor, Illinois. There were no signs of Viola anywhere in or around the vehicle. Viola worked at a medical facility and according to them, she never picked up her final paycheck. 
Angela came out and made a statement that her mother was a kind and loving individual, but she also mentioned that she had substance abuse problems in the past, and perhaps suspected that she was back to using, but she had been clean for five years. Although this gained some media attention at the time, primarily due to Angela's following from her American Idol appearance, leads quickly dried up. This didn't stop theories from popping up, though. Some allude to the fact that perhaps it was a drug deal gone wrong. Perhaps she overdosed after falling off the wagon. But if this was the case, where was her body? Why was her car abandoned? Why did she not pick up her last paycheck? Some think it could perhaps be a carjacking or robbery. But again, if that was the case, why the abandoned car? Where was the body? And why would the perpetrator not take the car or many of the items found inside? And still others believe the family had something to do with the disappearance. Why wait so long, days in fact, to report Viola missing, when she was supposed to be at her daughter's house within 20 minutes and never showed? But if that was the case, what was the motive? And what truly happened? Our mother Viola Martin has been missing for 11 years, since 2009. And it has been the hardest 11 years that my sisters and my family had to face. Angela Martin Fields now hoping this latest initiative from the Cook County Sheriff's Department will finally bring her mom home. Viola Martin went missing December of 2009 after a family Christmas get together in South Suburban Glenwood. She was never seen again. We're asking Chicago, our hometown, to please help us. We're asking the world to help us. And that's the mission behind the new Missing Persons Project. Nearly 170 cases dating back to 1930. Our goal is to help the different families, uh, the families who have had their hearts torn out, the families who have thought in any moment their loved one's going to walk through that door. The new effort includes dedicated detectives led by Commander Dion Trotter, whose child rescue unit recently found over a thousand juveniles missing from DCFS care. When you look at what we have today in 2020, 2021, there's some new technologies, there's some new things we could do to assist. Our hope is that some of these cases we're going to resolve so the family will finally have the resolution they never had. To this day, there are still no answers in regards to Viola's disappearance. It's... It's just... That should have never happened. I should always know where my daughter's at. I think about the day I dropped her off. I should have said more to her. I didn't know I, that was the last day I was going to see her. In December of 2015, 19-year-old Caitlin Aikens was visiting her sister's newborn baby in Virginia. And while she was there, she also got a chance to see her mother, Lisa, who lived in the area as well. Her trip was scheduled to come to a conclusion on the 5th of December, when she would fly back to Arizona in time to begin her cosmetology classes, which were scheduled to start on the 7th. She was booked to fly out of Reagan National Airport in Arlington, but she had to be at the airport close to 6 p.m. Her mother Lisa would have driven her, but Lisa had to be at work at 10 a.m. and would not be able to leave work to drop Caitlin off. So Lisa calls her ex-husband James and asks him if he would drop Caitlin off at the airport so she could make her flight. Now even though James and Lisa were separated and Caitlin wasn't James' biological daughter, he was still her stepfather and had a large share in raising her. And they also seemed to have a pretty good relationship so James agrees to drive Caitlin to the airport so she can make her flight. So the day that Caitlin is scheduled to leave, the 5th of December, Lisa drops Caitlin off at James's home in Fredericksburg a little after 9am. According to Lisa, James and Caitlin were happy to see each other and all three of them even spent time together catching up. Eventually though, it came time to drive Caitlin to the airport. James, who was employed at Dahlgren Naval Base, had to be at work by 3pm and so he would drop off Caitlin at the airport a few hours before her flight so he could make it to work on time. Lisa and Caitlin were both aware of this, and Caitlin was fine with being dropped off a few hours early. At some point after this, Caitlin would disappear. 
And this is also the point where some bizarre things begin to happen in regards to text messages sent by and about Caitlin to her family. In order to fully understand what happened, the best thing to do is to go in chronological order. At 11.56 a.m., Caitlin texts her fiancé, Amber, who is in Arizona. She says, Something came up. I'm not coming back today. I'll let you know when I get a new flight. Right after this text, she follows it up with, I won't be able to text for a bit. At 1.52 p.m., James texts Lisa and says he dropped off Caitlin. He then says, I dropped her at the Springfield Metro Station. She was going to take the Metro to the airport since there is a stop at Reagan. James is saying here that since Caitlin had to be dropped off so early, she asked him to drop her off at the Springfield Mall, where she could kill some time before taking the train to the airport, and James obliged. At 2 p.m., eight minutes later, Lisa gets a text from Caitlin, saying she just arrived at the airport and her phone battery is dying so she won't be able to text for a bit. Around this time, too, is when Amber, Caitlin's fiance, texts Lisa telling her about the message she received earlier regarding Caitlin not coming home that day, and asked if Lisa had any further information about why Caitlin said she wouldn't be coming home. Lisa had no idea, and at this point, Lisa's worry regarding what was going on with her daughter began to grow. A little after 7 p.m., Lisa received two more texts from Caitlin. One said, I'm staying with a friend. And the other text, which was sent immediately after, said, I need some time alone. Lisa immediately responded to Caitlin by texting her and saying, Call me. I am very worried about you. Please call me. It's around this point that Lisa noticed something a little odd. Caitlin's style of texting did not match what Lisa was receiving. According to Lisa, Caitlin would typically send one message, wait for the recipient to respond, and then send another. She wouldn't send a lot of separate messages at once like this. It just wasn't the typical way that Caitlin would usually communicate by text. And after this point, Caitlin stopped responding to her mother and she would not answer any of her calls. Shortly after this, Caitlin messaged her fiance Amber on Facebook with this simple message. I can't come back. I cheated on you. And just like Caitlin's mother, Lisa, Amber felt this message and these actions were very uncharacteristic of Caitlin. After this, Amber also lost communication with Caitlin. Two days after Caitlin was scheduled to depart Virginia on December 7th, a road crew worker that was working in a drainage ditch found luggage that ultimately ended up belonging to Caitlin. And based on how the luggage was spread out on the ground, the scuff marks on the luggage itself it was determined that the luggage was most likely thrown from a moving vehicle. In the suitcase were Caitlin's wallet, cash, debit cards, and credit cards, as well as her plane ticket home. What was missing from the suitcase were her phone, her high school diploma, which she had brought with her to present to her cosmetology school, and a few articles of clothing. None of Caitlin's friends or family would ever see her again. In an attempt to corroborate James's story, that is, he dropped her off before the airport at the Springfield Mall so she could kill time, CCTV footage was searched, and Caitlin's last known position was pinged from her phone. The way cell phone pinging works generally is when data is being transferred to and from your phone, you'll most likely be connected to multiple cell towers. Reversing this data from the phone to the cell tower can give an estimated location of where the phone was when it was sending and receiving data, such as phone calls or text messages. And while sometimes this can give investigators somewhat accurate data regarding where the individual was at the time their phone was pinged, this can also be very inaccurate, as the phone could be up to 20 miles away from the tower it's pulling from. When Caitlin's phone was pinged, it showed that when she texted her mother that she needed some time alone, it was discovered that Caitlin's phone never got past Fredericksburg, the area where James lived meaning all of the texts from Caitlin's phone throughout the day were all sent from a radius around James's home. The story gets stranger as you examine James's behavior. He originally agreed to take a polygraph test, but later declined to take it. Not something damning, as polygraphs are not nearly as reliable as law enforcement would like you to think they are, but still not the best look. What's an even worse look, though, is that James specifically said he wanted to leave early to drop Caitlin off at the airport so he could make it to work on time. But he never showed up for work that day. 
and he also refused to provide investigators the code for his cell phone so they could search it for further information. James's home was searched, but no evidence was found linking him directly to Caitlin's disappearance. In addition, Caitlin had previously revealed to a friend that at times, James was verbally abusive to her. It is not known if he was ever physically abusive. Eventually, Spotsylvania police would announce that James was not a suspect in Caitlin's disappearance and that his story was corroborated. They failed, however, to explain how this was the case. Years later, and Caitlin's case is still unsolved. There are no suspects, her whereabouts are unknown, and no body was ever discovered. Caitlin was 19 when I saw her last. She's 25 now. It's... It's just... That should have never happened. I should always know where my daughter's at. I think about the day I dropped her off. I should have said more to her. I didn't know I, that was the last day I was going to see her. You know? I should have been more, I should have been, because I was like, all right, I'll see you later. I'm going to go to work. Text, let, text me, let me know when you get to the airport. I should have said more than that, but I didn't know. These are just some of the kinds of missing persons cases that occur every day. People vanishing, sometimes leaving little to no trace. Sometimes there's just enough breadcrumbs to piece together a cloudy image of what happened, but still no definitive resolution or justice. One can only hope, as do the families and friends of the missing, that one day some of these cases might be solved and the mysteries put to rest for good. <laughs>